Well, if you were here last week, you heard me say that we're going to depart from our First Peter series and do something that we don't normally do. Now, I'm going to open the Bible, and we're going to talk about the Scripture, but typically I open the Bible, we look at a, a, a text, I exegete the text and explain to you what uh, it says, and we apply it. We're going to do something a little different today, because I told you last week that we're going to give an update on where we are concerning our building project. And it's going to be more than that. This is not going to be simply a presentation. It's going to be a reminder a reminder of who God is, a reminder of what God has called us to, a reminder of what God has done among us, and what we are anticipating God to do in the future. And so as I share these things, I want to call our attention to three promises from God's Word. Three promises that have really shaped our church from its inception but have over the last four years since we have acquired the property just south of here on Nolensville Road, these last four years, these promises have been particularly helpful in guiding our steps as we're following God's call. Bear in mind as I'm reading, these are the words of God. I'm going to begin from the book of Hebrews, the great hall of fame chapter of faith. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says this, Without faith, no one can please God. Anyone who comes to God must believe that He is real and that He rewards those who truly want to find Him. Now, the words of Jesus. Jesus, having just raised a man from the dead, Lazarus, He then looks at His disciples and says, Did I not tell you? That if you believe, you will see the glory of God. And then lastly, the, the promise that has been our sort of anchoring text throughout this journey God has called us on. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, Paul writes, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times you may abound in every good work. You know, one of the most daring, soul-inspiring endeavors in the history of mankind was actually inaugurated on May the 21st, 1965. I'm sorry, May the 25th, 1961. I'm a history guy. I don't like to miss that. That day, there was an outlandish dream that was presented, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity with world-changing consequences and implications. This was a dream that required unprecedented commitment and resources. This great dream, this great calling was articulated by John F. Kennedy and the dream was to move mankind from merely looking at the moon to actually walking on the moon. Our entire country ordered itself around that calling. A uh, hundred plus thousand people were involved in making that happen. Five percent of our national budget was spent to see this dream become a reality. And here's what's crazy. You realize that the computing power in your iPhone is about 250,000 times more powerful than the computer in the Apollo 11 module that landed the men on the moon. And we look at Instagram pictures. When Neil Armstrong took that first big step on January, I'm sorry, July the 20th, 1969. When he took that first big step, he took all of humanity with him. And that's kind of where we are right now as a church. A moonshot. Something beyond where we are that God is calling us to. God has called us to a moonshot. And this calling will have life-transforming, world-changing implications. You know... Anytime you have a great dream, a great calling, 
Anytime the stakes are high and what's at stake are the souls of people. Anytime the, the stakes are high, the cost will always be great. And this calling has and will continue to require unprecedented amounts of, of prayer, of faith, of commitment, and of resources. But here's kind of what blows my mind about this calling. You realize that there will, there will, not be, there will never be another generation at South Point Community Church that will have the privilege of building something of this level of significance and magnitude. We're standing at a unique place in our collective story where we get to steward an unprecedented opportunity and we get to make history. We get to engage in a major step forward in God's work, laying the foundation for future generations, your children and your children's children, to build upon. So this morning, I want to do a few things. I want to celebrate what God has done at South Point. I want to recognize what God is currently doing at South Point. And I want to dream about where we think he's clearly leading us in the future. So we're going to look at our roots, where have we come from. We're going to look at our destination, what's our calling, where are we going. And we're going to talk about the invitation God is making to everybody in here to be part of it. Now, I said we're going to do things a little differently today, and I'm going to do that because I'm going to invite a guest on the stage. Uh, I invite Kevin Underwood to come on up here. So Kevin... Uh, Kevin and his wife Sarah have five children. Kevin is one of the original uh, members of South Point Community Church. He is an elder at our church. He is the head of our building committee. He is also a, a dear personal friend who has had a real impact in my life. I am a far better person because of Kevin's uh, impact and investment in me. So we're going to sort of tag team here. He preceded me as I was a church planning pastor. He came before. So he's going to take you way back to when this, I, this was just an idea. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Kevin. Yes. Yeah, so we kind of say officially we started in 2010. Uh, and we've got some images from that. Uh, Really, we started, the concept started in 2007. We were going to West End Community Church on White Bridge Road, and uh, we were real involved in our community here and coaching, and our wives were in a Bible study, and so the guys got a Bible study just so our wives would feel better about us and <laughs> feel like we were doing our part. Uh, but we started building community and community down here, and people started to notice and see cars at our houses and ask what was going on, and... Uh, and we'd tell them, they'd go, oh, that sounds great, but like going to White Ridge Road is like a southwest flight from down here, so we're not <laughs> going to do that. So uh, we started, as Matt said, when you start asking God questions, uh, be careful what you ask for. So we kind of started saying, what if? So uh, three of us got together uh, at Coldstone Creamery over in the Target parking lot on Old Hickory and kind of said, what if we went and asked about starting a church down here? And uh, so from that day in 2007, we kind of started calling it Project Coldstone. <laughs> there was no South Point name at that point. So there were kind of three families, and then we started talking to some other families, and then there were 10 families, and there were a few more families. And uh, it was time to go to the leadership at West End and say, here's what's going on. Uh, we're in relationship down here. Uh, we want to minister where we work, live, and play, and that's not up here, and we feel like it's time to be down here. So many amazing stories. There's a story of a little boy named Dantes that lived in the trailer across from the dump on Sunset that kind of became part of our family and trying to pick him up and take him to church and taking two cars to church. And our kids were little. The little girl in the pink is my daughter Eliza that is finishing her freshman year of college next week. So this was a long time ago. So we're trying to go to church up there, and we're like, when kids get in middle school and it's the worst time of their lives, you know, they need people that they know from church and are going to be in their school that they could share a 
tear with or share a quick prayer with and have community even at that age. So, uh, and we were tired of giving our kids Altoids on the way home from church, trying to keep them awake till we could get them home and get them a nap. So, all that said, we stepped off the cliff and went to the leadership and said, hey, we're interested in a satellite campus or planning a church down here. What do you think? And they weren't real interested, to be honest. And uh, so we talked through it, and they asked a lot of difficult questions that making sure it just wasn't for convenience, but it was actually a call to ministry in the community. And uh, they said, okay, we're going to let you guys go for it. So uh, we told them what we were looking for, for seed money to get started, and they told us what we were willing to give. And I'm like, well, we're dead before we ever started because we can't do anything with that. So we all agreed to fast and pray and came back, and they came up with a little more money and uh, kicked in these brown chairs that we've borrowed and never given back all these years later. <laughs> and... Uh, so let's get started. So at that point, we needed two things. We needed a place, and we needed a pastor. So they worked with us. We identified a guy, uh, which wasn't Matt, uh, to be our church planter. He came on board and kind of tried to help us get started, and then we needed a place to meet. So we thought we were going to be Nolensville Road and Concord Road, the epicenter. And uh, yeah, we didn't have any money. So we started looking around to figure out what we could find out. We stumbled across this space. This place had been empty for a year. It was just a shell, concrete floor, steel roof, nothing in here. We met with the owner. We told him our story, kind of told him our vision, and we put together this pro forma. We had, once again, had no money, had nothing, no history, just three guys and their families. And uh, we put together this marketing plan. It was a lot of smoke and mirrors. And we said, now this isn't us, but this is our parent church, and they got a million dollar budget. And and the guy, we said the Lord blinded him, but he showed favor. He owned uh, Schaub Construction. So he's like, okay, I'll do it. I'll build it out. He paid for the money. So we signed the first lease. It was pretty much kind of the lobby to this first column over here. So then we're like, well, that's not going to be enough room. So we're like, hey, Jay, we still don't have any more money or anything. But uh, So we went to that back column, the second column. And uh, we got ready to get started, and literally three weeks after we signed the lease, it became very obvious that our church planter wasn't going to work out, and he wasn't going to be able to get ordained. And we're like, what have you done, Lord? What, what have you called us into here? Because, man, it seemed like it was a stretch anyway. Now it seems impossible. So uh, we met with the leadership at West End, and once again, it's great being part of a uh, a session up there in a presbytery and having some rails and guidance, and they walked through us, and uh, we started moving ahead. And we didn't have a pastor, so we started looking for one. And so when you're looking for a pastor, the crazies come out. I'm just saying. <laughs> People, we had one guy applied for the job that was in prison when he applied for the job, and we're like, well, how's that going to work? But he, he was hoping to the get... Job. <laughs> yeah, he was hoping he was going to get out in time to start, so... Anyway, through the PCA, we connected with some people and ended up connecting with Matt. So we had some conversations with Matt, and then we went down to Atlanta to watch him preach one Sunday morning, and Matt's like preaching to a thousand people, and we're like, he's never going to come up here. We don't even have anything, and there's maybe going to be 30 of us. Why would that guy leave this to come to Nolensville? And here he is, so yeah. you... There's a picture of me. That was 10,000 cheeseburgers ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, it, it's really interesting because I, um, <clears throat> so when, when we moved to Nolensville in 2010, there were 3,500 people that lived in Nolensville. The church I was on staff at had 3,500 people at the late service. So it was quite the juxtaposition, but I love the church. It was a fantastic church. Largest church in our denomination, Perimeter Church in Atlanta. They were absolutely incredibly helpful in helping me get here. But, I, you know, I realized at some point I wanted to be a pastor. It's very hard to be a pastor at a church of that size. Uh, I felt like I was in spiritual middle management, uh, aiming to be a spiritual CEO. And so we looked at, uh, Christy and I looked at several options, and honestly, this was the least attractive one, <laughs> and it was for two reasons. One is, we call it Nowheresville, Tennessee. I mean, literally, our, our neighborhood in Atlanta was bigger than Dolphin was at the time. But the other bigger reason was, I had to raise a lot of money. 
a lot of money. Uh, and so I sort of put this down, but frankly, after spending some time with the families, Kevin, his family, other families who were down here, uh, I just really felt like God was calling. I said, I feel like God wants us to walk with them long term. And uh, my wife said something. Uh, I, we, were, we were literally came up here and we were leaving. And she said, I really like this option. I think you do too. And I was like, you're right. And she said, how you feeling? I'm like, I don't know. And she said, it's about the money, isn't it? We had to raise about $350,000. And I said, yeah, and, and she said something that's always stuck with me. She said, at some point, you've got to stop asking what's possible, and you've got to start asking what's God's will. So do you think this is God's will or not? And, I mean, honestly, when, once we made, we, we, we ch I signed the paper to accept the call to come here uh, 14 years ago yesterday. It was on 420 day, and I, I wondered if I had not celebrated 420 before I signed it. <laughs> Um, but I, uh, you know what, within 75 days, that $350,000 was raised. And that was in 2010, which was in, you know, again, Atlanta, Georgia got decimated by the recession and it was not easy. Uh, it, you know, God chose to provide for this church, but when we came to move here, God did not choose to provide for us, uh, a, a buyer for our house. Our, we sold our house a year later for half of what we paid for it. And so we ended up having to rent up here for six years until we were able to afford a house again. But this whole season was all about feeling the call of God, it not being easy, which forced us to develop our faith muscles in way we did, ways we didn't even want. And yet again and again and again, we saw the glory of God as we followed him. And if you want to, uh, we were particularized in 2013. What that means in our denomination is that we actually were able to elect elders. We were financially self-sufficient. Uh, it takes most churches in our denomination five to six years to get there. It's not easy. We were able to do it in under three. And then we began to grow. Uh, and there, we're, this was not a linear kind of growth. We literally... Uh, experience the ups and downs of moving from a Bible study with a band into an actual <laughs> church. And we had to exercise without faith. It's impossible to please God. We had to lean on Jesus' promise that he will build his church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And throughout that, we continue to live out Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations. Uh, we had little things happen like we wanted to do, I had a, a, a church member Kim King wanted to start a parent's day out because she said, look at all these families around here. At the time, there was no daycare or anything like that. She's like, you realize how much ministry we could have if we opened something up for kids? And it's like Kevin said, we didn't have any money. We didn't have any space. Uh, and so she's like, well, why don't we do a consignment sale? I'm like, what is a con I don't even know what that is. And uh, we did the consignment sale to raise money. And it's funny, we had so many new people come to our church through the consignment sale. In fact, Miss Katie, our children's director up front, she came to that first consignment sale in 2014. And that helped us raise the kind of money to open a Parents' Day Out. Many of you have benefited from the ministry of that Parents' Day Out. That's the highest rated one in town. It's got a waiting list now a mile long. But this is where we came from, and it wasn't always easy, as Kevin can tell you. Yeah, no, you know, Matt was amazing raising money, and uh, being in a nice building here, that was kind of our, our desire, that it was the wild west of church plants in Nolansville during this time, and everybody was in a school setting up, and we'd come from a church plant and trying to clean up after the mice before you have church and kids on Sunday morning. It's a disaster. So we're like, let's have a facility where people will come and feel safe and it's comfortable. And it took money to do that. When we say things were rough, there were many Sundays, depending on what the offering and the giving was on Sunday, depending on whether Matt got paid on Monday. That's the way we lived. We have been on our knees every day since we planted this this church. I was praying louder than anybody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so in 2016, uh, 
you know, we, we had, once again, this was based on families and our, our children's ministry and our students' ministry. And once again, we, we cobbled it together. Sarah and Kirsten Mickelson were our first children's ministry directors. I was our first youth director. It was horrible. <laughs> I'm just saying. It was bad. But we were, it was all in to whatever it took to get it done. So we were finally growing. We had a real student ministries director. I'm like, we need some space for our students. Uh, and the building owner came to us and said, hey, uh, the office at the end of the space uh, is going to open up, and there's that garage, and I feel like it'd be perfect for you guys because at this point, once again, still not having money and funds, we expanded from this column back uh, to where the soundboard was and expanded one more time to get that back lobby space. So the guy just kept giving us he just kept showing up for us. And uh, he goes, I think that would be great space for you all. And we're like, man, we are close to being overextended and we're called to stewardship. So as uh, leadership, we met and said, Lord, it feels like this is the right space to have for our students. It was like a great Clips training center. There were barber chairs and stuff back <laughs> there. Said, this, is, this feels right to us, but we don't feel like as, as stewards that this is the right thing. So we said, all right, let's put this out to the body. And uh, we need to raise $30,000 to kind of cover us for three years to make sure we can pay rent and do what we need to do. And we took four weeks and told the body, this is what we're going to do. And depending how we end up, we're going to take this or not. Four weeks showed up. It didn't happen. And we're like... We were 30000 short. Yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. We're like, God, this seems just so the right thing to do. But clearly you have shut this door and we said we were going to walk away, and that's what we're going to do. Matt got up and told the story. After the service, a lady wrote us a $30,000 check, and that's the way we have operated from day one. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, God's a theory until you put him to the test and he becomes a reality. But you, you have to take a step of faith. And I'll be honest with you. I don't have the gift of faith. My wife does. I have the gift of worry or the curse of worry, right? But I can't tell you how again and again God chose to withhold to give us more of himself. And I don't know that that was anywhere more apparent than how we found this property uh, that we've bought. So let's go to the next slide. Yeah, yeah. So, in, and so in, let me tell you what happened. So in February, we've been looking for property. And here's why. We were in that lower middle class trap of paying a lot of money for rent. Rent here is $30,000 a month. Uh, it wasn't a lot cheaper back then. And we were like, okay, we, we don't want to be in the rent trap, but it's like a lower middle class family. You're paying so much for rent, you can't save up for a down payment. But we scrimped and we saved and we got a little bit. And we thought if we could just get five to 10 acres around here, that, that would set us up for the future. And so we had a, a real estate agent here in, at South Point, Tyler King. Tyler is a, like a bird dog. He can find deals. And he found a piece of property that was in a trust that had been up for sale uh, back in like 2010. And it didn't sell. And so he just wondered, who owns this property? He searched and he looked and he finally found the guy that owned it. Uh, we went and looked at it and I made the mistake of going with Tyler to walk. We trespassed walk across that property and going, oh, can you imagine if we could get something like this? So he reached out to the person, found him. Turns out the guy had become a Christian fairly recently and had been hiking that property with his life coach. And he'd been using it for hunting and thought, you know, what am I going to do with this? Am I going to build a big house out here and hunt in my backyard? Or am I going to do something else? And as he and his life coach were walking and talking, he goes, you know, it'd be cool to have a church out here. Well, we meet with him, we hit it off, we share the vision. He, is, he buys it hook, line, line, and sinker. So he says, I'd be very open to selling this property to y'all. And we were like, well, we don't have any money. We just want wonder if you were interested. Maybe we have some of it. <coughs> and we said, so, so what do you want for it? 114 acres. He said, I'll tell you what, I will. What did, he goes, what was it for sale for back in 2010? 13,000 an acre. I'll take that. 114 acres right there for $1.5 million. Okay. We were blown away. Awesome. Well, we got to raise half a million dollars 
to, for a down payment. We don't have that much money. That was the first week of March of 2020. You remember what happened the second week of March of 2020? Uh, our good old buddy COVID-19 showed up and uh, screwed all of our lives up. Well, I tell you what, again and again, I would meet people down there. I'd walk them around the property. I would ask them to, to be part of this. We talked about it, and we raised half a million dollars, and we put a contract on it, and it was like the biggest thing we'd ever done. And again, we went from having a 10-acre vision to now we've got to have a 114-acre vision, and it caused us all to kind of drop back and say, Lord, what are you calling us to? This is your church. It's not ours. You've given us something, but now we've got to steward it. So I'm going to turn it over to, uh, by the way, some pandemic pictures. We did survive the pandemic. It was awful. Uh, I, at some point, I had pictures of y'all on these chairs. I was preaching to a camera and looking at these pictures because we couldn't meet. It was yeah. awful. And then you had the political turmoil. Our numbers are just now getting back to where they were pre-COVID. Now, our giving never changed, which is incredible. And our giving has grown significantly. But it took a long time to finally get back to normal, which is where we are now. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Kevin. Yes, yeah, so we had this property, and then we got to figure out what to do with it and what are we called to. So uh, we put together a facility committee and kind of asked some folks to uh, work with us for a year to help develop a master plan, a 100-year plan of what this land could be. And uh, I, I just a, a quick shout-out to uh, Michael Livingston, Drew McMillan, Kim King, C. Notch Keisinger, that uh, what was supposed to be a year, uh, a year investment ended up about two-and-a-half-year investment. And uh, so here's what we ended up with. Some of this you've seen before, and then I'm going to show you kind of what, what's new and where we're going next. But we were tasked with what do we do for 100 years, our, our kids and our grandkids and future generations on this property? So it lends itself really well to, uh, you can see Nolansville Road here, uh, you know, a multi-building a multi -building campus that, you know, that whether this is a five-year, 10-year, 30-year, 50-year plan, but, uh, you know, plenty of room for gym, school, uh, education space, camping space, all sorts of zip line space, many amazing things. We want the, the community out here on this property. So here's just a few images of, of what the future could, could look like. Kind of a Main Street concept like you see in Brentwood and Green Hills and some shopping complexes. Uh, this would kind of be phase one here on the corner. Uh, you can drive down, shut the road off. You can have your activities and parties out here in the middle with green space. and just really uh, kind of take advantage of the land. So that's, that's our big vision. So now what do we do with phase one? Well, we worked on phase one about six different versions. So now I'm going to share with you where we are and what we're going to do. So Nolansville Road, uh, the church here with the great neon sign is right here. Uh, here's our new bridge that's gone in. Somebody goes, man, that bridge looks a little small. Well, technically... Three cars can fit on that bridge, so if you were wondering, it's, it's large enough. So uh, you enter on Nolansville Road, we'll have our parking down here, and we're going to kind of take this corner. Uh, we're kind of nestled up against the woods here and trying to stay, uh, stay out of the woods uh, to keep our site costs down. Uh, and then this whole little beautiful area down here that if you've been by, it's covered in orange fencing. That's our septic field, and it'll be fenced off and the best piece of the property we can't use. But, uh, <laughs> but working around all of that uh, is, where we are, is where we are now. So I'm going to show you a few pictures. Uh, here's what the facility will look like as you're coming up the drive from Nolansville Road. Our goal is really to try to work with the land, kind of have a state park feel and, and take uh, advantage of the beauty of the property that God's given us. We'll go to the next slide. This is uh, coming to the back out of the sanctuary. We'll have kind of a green space, a lawn. We can have parties, activities, see families and kids hanging out after service and in between services here. This is uh, looking out onto that green space, and then the playground is off in the distance over here behind us. Cover drop-off for uh, Sunday mornings in the PDO. You can uh, stack two cars up, and you can get in and get it when it's raining and snowing, get in without getting wet. 
It's a picture of the lobby, once again, uh, uh, you know, trying to go with kind of natural woods and as much glass as we can and keep it very simple and open. Coffee area, and this is the view headed down towards Sanctuary and South Point Kids, and uh, we will not be having, uh, you know, French press coffee. <laughs> ignore, those, uh, ignore those renderings, so... Here's a picture of the sanctuary, once again, kind of open and light. I uh, have some windows up at the top to let some natural, some natural light in. Here's our South Point kid check-in. Uh, you dead end into the hall. Everything's gated and secured to get in and get into the children's area. Here's a picture of the classrooms. Classrooms will have windows, will have doors for emergency egress and safety and security. We'll have cabinets, sinks in the classrooms. Uh, the classrooms will share uh, bathrooms, Jack and Jill bathrooms. There'll be uh, bathrooms in the classrooms. And look at those dads in their servant and children's ministry. Isn't that great? <laughs> so here's the layout of the land. So uh, up at the top of the screen, you're coming up from Nolansville Road. You loop around. Here is the, the covered drop-off. You walk into the space, into the lobby. Our bathrooms are here. Uh, coffee area is here on the corner that you saw in the rendering. If you work in hospitality, there is a coffee communion prep room right beside with the sink, so you don't have to go all the way to the back of the building uh, to clean up the coffee. Uh, so as you come down the hall, you come in and you enter in the back of the multi-purpose space sanctuary, looking at the stage. Uh, space will hold 300 seats for Sunday for worship. Uh, and you come out. And you walk down the hall, and you dead in into South Point Kids check-in. Uh, once again, you're, you're buzzed in, or on Sunday mornings, you're checked in. You'll check in here. You'll enter the space. Uh, we have our nursery space. Uh, we've got a second office entry here. We have a church office here, so delivery, sick kid pickup, things with PDO during the week. Uh, this will be the entry point for that. Uh, once again, this area, these doors are all secure. Uh, we've got our children's ministry classrooms. We actually uh, gain one classroom in the space from what we currently have now, uh, kind of a larger warehouse-type space here, and then the playground is fenced in at the end of the children's hallway. So once again, we've been through a lot of redesigns. We're going to talk about why in a little bit, but feel like this is an amazing space, very similar in size to kind of what we have now, uh, gives us much more flexibility much more safety, much more functionality with our classrooms and bathrooms for the kids. It's going to function great for the PDO, also function great for Sunday morning. So we talk about what's next down the road. Uh, once again, as we're trying to design for 100 years, we're trying to design what happens next. So in previous renderings and things, you saw the, uh, this says New Sanctuary Lobby. This would be phase two. This was the original first phase uh, that we're not building currently. So right now we're building where it says new classrooms, and that would be the sanctuary in phase one, and then uh, the classrooms down the hallway. Phase two, we convert the sanctuary here, converts into classrooms. So as the PDO grows and we move into having a school, these become classrooms and we have the education wing and then the new uh, multi-purpose sanctuary and new lobby goes right on the front of the building. Uh, you know, we're just able to wall it off and start construction and then open it up without really, uh, you know, losing a lot of time and effort. So uh, that's kind of where we are, where we've ended up and kind of what's to come. Uh, the exciting news that I want to share with you is uh, uh, we've started the bridge and that's the first thing of getting on the property and being able to function. So that is complete. We are in final process of construction documents, permitting. We are going to start construction in June this summer. And we'll be, we'll be in the building the next summer of 25. So great news. It's been forever to get here, but we're finally here and we're ready to go. Yep. Yep. So, uh, you know, the reason we're doing this, the reason we do anything we do is our mission statement. We think God has called us to glorify him by bringing this area and everywhere we serve into a life-changing encounter with the kingdom of God. 
We're not simply trying to set up church to do church. We're not just religious. We're not mild-mannered people telling other mild-mannered people how to be more mild-mannered. That's not what we're doing. We are trying to create a movement. We are, we are literally, and if you think about where we are, you realize that uh, right now, Rutherford County has doubled in size in the last 15 years. 370,000 people in Rutherford County. There'll be 700,000 people in Rutherford County in the next 10 years. Williamson County, we've doubled since I've been here. Last 14 years, we've doubled. There are about 250,000 people in Williamson County. It's going to double again in the next 12 years, and that's with some of the most restricted building uh, covenants uh, known to mankind. Our property is right in the epicenter of all that growth. God has called us <laughs> to help people have life-changing encounters with his kingdom. He has brought the community to exactly where we're going to be. Our calling is to try to create spaces. Again, we don't just want a church. One of the reasons we have a parent's day out is because we want to minister to all these people that we haven't been ministering to. People who would never naturally come to church, they'll put their kids there. They'll come on our campus. And so we want this to be not just a Sunday church, but a ministry center that is utilized throughout the week. Now, we're already doing that. But we want to see our ability grow. And we're not just looking to expand seating capacity. We're looking to expand sending capacity. But we want to leave a legacy. We're generation one of what we're praying to be a 10-generational minimum fruitful witness of the gospel. And we want to leave a legacy of thriving churches that we plant and change lives. And what we all know is... You cannot surrender your soul to the status quo if you're walking with God. We can't just status quo this. And I want you to imagine all that God's going to do on this property. Uh, that We already have three miles of trails out there. What would it be like to develop those further, to have camping spots, to have um, uh, opportunities for the community to go on that property, to enjoy creation, to put their screens down, to engage life to life, to sit around as families and, and, and learn about the kingdom of God. What would it be like to have inner city kids and suburban kids come together because we partner with like Barefoot Republic, see that happening, or a community garden or an elementary school where we're able to invest in the emerging generation and inculcate them with the truths of the gospel? That is where we're going, okay? Now, what's the next slide here? Let me tell you what y'all have done so far. Uh, since 2020, we've raised $4 million. That's amazing. Uh, we had a consultant come in when we did our capital campaign. He said, you'll probably be able to raise no more than $3 million. We raised four. In fact, we had three point. Two five million dollars of pledges for our God is Able campaign, and we actually raised three point four million, and that's uh, and that's uh, in spite of people who weren't able to fulfill their pledges or who may have left the church. So God has been so so good to us, and we want to sit in that. Now, next slide. Yeah. So this has been uh, a long, as I said, two and a half plus years of of, of process. Uh, so we purchased our land, we've designed this thing, and once again, it's a beautiful piece of land, but, uh, and it's a, an expensive piece of land. There's no sewer there. We've got uh, blue line streams that really aren't streams, but the government says they are, so we've got to navigate around all that. And, uh, you know, and then we've got our cost of construction, uh, which is $11 million. So the whole project is $13.8 million. Uh, we've gotten to this point that we have designed this about six times, it feels like, that uh, you know, we're, we're moving forward and we're going, and then post-pandemic building costs were double, and we couldn't afford to build what we wanted to build. And then interest rates. And then interest <laughs> rates, and it was just like we have kept shrinking the building. We valued engineer literally a month ago, we valued engineered another quarter of a million dollars out of this that uh, have really just been to be, try to be faithful stewards of what God's called us to, but how can we work with what we've got? So we were finally had, uh, thought we had a plan. It's on the sign out on the property. You saw the sign in the lobby and you've seen the renderings. 
Yeah, well, you might have noticed it's, those renderings got pulled. Uh, we, while my team was working, the finance team was working to find us money to get us a loan for this and talk about a process. They talked to hundreds of banks and financial institutions trying to find us money. We finally found one. Thought it was great. We designed that budget, and literally we were three days from closing with Wilson Bank and Trust, and they walked away from the deal and left us high and dry. And we let them know how not great that was. Not that we haven't forgiven them. We love them in the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> so all of a sudden, we're like, Lord, what now? We have designed this building to, to this budget based on this loan, and now we don't have it, so it's back to the drawing board. So we started trying to shrink the building some more, and the finance team started looking for loans and investment and found an investment firm out of California, probably one of the only good things to come out of California, and they stepped up and Except they gave us a loan. Yes, Except and you that are here, <laughs> you that are here. So, all right, so what does all this mean? So you heard this story, and we've been through the process, and we valued engineered. So we raised $4 million. We got a million three in savings. We got a construction loan of $7.5 million. And you know what? We're still a million dollars short. Really, technically, we're $986,929 short, but a million sounds uh, a little easier to remember. So a few weeks ago, we had uh, the elders and diaconate got together, and we just laid it all, all out on the table and said, man, it feels like the Lord has called us to this for all these years Doors have opened, doors have closed, but he's not changed our calling and our vision. What are we going to do? I'm like, guys, we have valued engineered this building. There's nothing left. We're going to have to start cutting classrooms and we're going to be smaller than we are here. It doesn't make any sense to move and do this if we have to go any smaller. Everybody agreed with that. We said, the body has been faithful. You guys have been faithful and you raised $4 million. And the capital campaign just ended in March. We're supposed to be celebrating, done, close the books, not ask for any more money. That's not the reality. And what really came out of that meeting and, and to a person, everybody said, wow, you know, this is a lot like uh, we thought we were going to build our forever home. And you know what? Yeah, when we started doing it in our personal lives, you build your starter home. And, uh, you know, we've tried to, to scrimp and save and be good stewards and Everything's coming with us. We're not spending money. These brown chairs are coming. The fridges are coming. And, you know, we're taking everything, you know, and just trying to get in there. So, you know, we've had to realign ourselves. Hey, this is our starter home. You know, kind of like when you, when you get in, you go, oh, I'm not going to do marble cab uh, countertops. I'm going to do laminate, and I'll change it, and you never do. And when you get there and you're so broke in your first home, you can't even afford curtains and you put bed sheets on the window, that's, <laughs> that's where we are here. It's going to be nice and safe and clean, but it's not frivolous and fancy. So we kind of said, what do we do? Do we stop now or do we keep going? And to a person, everybody said, this is a chance for us to continue to live by faith and to give sacrificially and to lead our body in that. And that's the way we have operated from day one to now. Yeah. Let me get the next slide up here. Um, you know, Kevin's done a great job of saying kind of where we are, where we've come from. Uh, the, the next obvious question is, how, what are we going to do? How are we going to pay for this? I'm, I'm encouraged. The words of a great missionary, William Carey, he says that God's work done God's way will not lack for God's resources. I think we are doing God's work in God's way. And this is really where we all come in. Uh, God could choose to do this any way he wants to. Just like, you know, God could have written John 3.16 in the stars in every language. But instead of doing that, he looked at you and me and said, "Go, you go tell people about me. And in the same way, I could be out in my yard this afternoon digging in the flower bed and find a coffee can with $2 million in it probably not going to happen. We're not going to take a part of the church budget and use it to go play Powerball. What should we do? Uh, first thing, I want you just to, to savor this moment. You realize that very few churches ever get the opportunity to do something like this. We are in a, at this amazing moment 
to see our church grow in its impact. And we think God has called us to this. You realize there's not another church in this area that has this kind of opportunity when it comes to impacting. And, 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 you know, we want to savor what God has done and what he's calling us to. The thing, the, the thing we need to know, though, is because we believe God is calling us to this, we, we, I think there's more than enough money in this church to make this happen. Uh, but I do think, like the moonshot, this vision is going to take every single family in our church to continue to sacrificially commit uh, and, and all... Uh, pitch in for this to happen every every one of us has got to be all in you know i, I mean I, what i know about giving is this i know there, there are many times where christy and i'll be praying about how much to give and i'll write down a number that makes me smile i feel good about that but then you know you kind of look over your shoulder at god and god's not smiling as much as you are and you kind of have to kind of have to knock that out and put one that would actually make him smile it's going to take something like that but I do know this. The answer to how we do this is in this room. And I don't say that to put pressure on you. I say that to be real as your pastor. We just don't have any options that don't include your significant contribution and investment. And, and again, I, I think we have to all give sacrificially. Will we all give the same? No. But what I want is, my longing is for all of us to say, I want to be part of that. Now, we may not all give the same, but I want 100% participation to, because we are all together collectively living by faith. To the degree that if somebody walked in after this service and said, Pastor, I'd like to write you a million-dollar check, we would still do this. Because who knows? Maybe we need to go ahead and build the second phase. Maybe we just need to throw it out there. We don't know. We just want to get on that property uh, and we want to steward what God has given us. But we do want everybody to give sacrificially. Not the same amount, but the same sacrifice. You know, I'll say this. This is the single most important thing that we're going to do in the next 25 years. This is what gets us out of temporary church and into permanent church. And so I think we need to be praying together. Every one of us pray. Now, we've got, uh, you've got a pledge card, which I've got mine somewhere. Uh, well, I don't have one. So uh, <laughs> find a pledge card. You see the pledge card? Yeah, yeah. So now it's just easiest to take a picture of the QR code. I want you to take four weeks, you and your family, to pray about this. And I don't want you just to pray about it. Uh, there is a, on the property, there's like that old beat-up house trailer that we're going to tear down. It's got a fence around it now because we've started construction. We're going to cut the lock on the gate, open it up, and... Uh, between now and the end of May, before construction starts, I want you to go out there. I want you to go out there with your kids. I want you to walk around. If you don't know how to get around the property, you can email the church, info at spcommunity.org. We'll shoot you a digital map. And take bug spray. Yeah, take bug spray. There are ticks out there. Uh, no poisonous snakes, but they're snakes. But, you know, that makes life interesting. Um, we're not that kind of church, though. We're not a snake church. Uh, but, but I want you to go out there with your kids, and I want you all to pray as a family. Lord, what are you calling us to? Look at your kids. They're going to grow up out there. And so what we want is for you to take the card, walk around, pray it through. The card's got prayer requests on the back. We're asking everybody to be 100% committed to praying every day for this project. Let's just see what God has for us. Um, you know, at the end of the day, this is not just about getting into a building. It never has been. This is about we want more of God and we want to follow him. We don't think this is extravagant. We think this is he's miraculously provided. And we think uh, he providentially knew about the ridiculous amount of inflation and the fact that literally construction costs are 100% more than they were in 2021. He knew all this. And he wants us to call and he wants us to follow him so that we can have more of him, not just a building. You know, I cannot believe I get to pastor this church. It's an incredible church. There is nothing else on this planet I would rather do than to pastor this church and move forward with you. Because we're never going to be the same. This is the moonshot. And I look forward to touching down with you in this process. So let's bow our heads. And I'm going to invite the worship team to come out. And we're going to conclude in song.
Father in heaven, thank you. You have been so good to us as we sang earlier. God, thank you that not just as a church, but everybody in this room has got crazy stories of your goodness to us. And Lord, I know that you're calling us here not because, God, you're not short of cash, but we are often short of an experience of you. So Father, we pray that as we follow you in sacrifice, you would, you would give us infinitely more than we could ask or imagine. Now Lord, do this and do more. Forgive us for having small vision. Help us to follow you. And thank you for all these things in Christ's name. Amen.